Philippines, ICT Watch from Indonesia, and Social Media Matters from India. We are delighted to know that we're joined by participants today coming from industry, civil society, academic, and the public sector. We hope to find you all in good spirits for today's discussion because we have a diverse set of speakers to talk about online safety, how we think of digital citizenship, and how to respond to the many challenges and opportunities that digital technology poses to children and their families. Before we start, I'll share a couple of house rules and guidelines uh, for everyone here today. So the event is live. You are in view and listen only mode and cannot be seen or heard. On the right of the screen, you will see the stream chat, which can be used to post questions to our panel of speakers. We will be addressing selected questions posted here during panel discussion. The virtual event will be recorded and by continuing in this event, you are consenting to be recorded. So we hope that is clear for everyone. So we will go directly now to Mr. Stephen Balcom's presentation. Mr. Stephen Balcom is the founder and CEO of the Family Online Safety Institute, an international nonprofit organization headquartered in Washington, DC. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, speaking to you from uh, the United States and uh, very pleased to be with you all. I'm just gonna try and uh, bring my screen up and my PowerPoint slide and uh, see if we can make a start here. Um, so yes, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to be talking to you this morning um, about some recent research that we did in the United States, and we followed it up uh, early this year in the Asia Pacific region. And we called the research Tools for Today's Digital Parents. And we wanted to have a look at parental use and attitudes towards parental controls. Um, so before I talk about the research, I think it'd probably be worth saying a few words about uh, the organization, FOSI. Uh, we're an international nonprofit working to make the online world safer for kids and their families. Um, and we are a membership organization. We have nearly 30 of the top uh, tech companies in the world, um, from AT&T to uh, Verizon in the alphabet, uh, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, but also uh, Netflix, who have very kindly supported um, our efforts for a number of years in the region and have uh, fully sponsored this event today. So a big thank you to them. Um, you know, at FOSI, we talk about the three Ps of policy, practices, and parenting. What do I mean by that? Well, we talk about enlightened public policy. This is public policy that is generated and developed based on evidence and research uh, and after a great deal of discussion between uh, lawmakers, industry, NGOs, and ordinary folks. And uh, to that end, we follow the public policy uh, developments here in the United States, in the EU, and also in the Asia Pacific region. Um, we talk to lawmakers, we educate them as best we can, we uh, speak to regulators um, about our own concerns around child safety, uh, and of course here in the United States we have a new administration in which we are going to begin to educate folks in that administration um, about online safety issues. The second P is industry best practices, and what I mean by that is the tools and uh, the policies that many of our member companies have already developed uh, in this space. And in fact, we'll be seeing some examples of that from Netflix and also from VIP Kid, another FOSI member who will be talking on the industry panel. Um, so we, we work to up their trust and safety offerings. And um, we also do work behind the scenes. So we sit on the safety advisory board at Facebook, the Trust and Safety Council 
at Twitter and a number of the other companies who have these formal and informal means by which we can offer constructive criticism. And the third P is a project we call Good Digital Parenting. And the idea behind that is we try to empower parents to confidently navigate the web with their kids. And we do that by providing um, resources and an online safety contract. Uh, we provide um, uh, regular blogs and uh, events to help parents to get to understand the devices and the apps that their children use, uh, as well as the video games and websites and so on. And uh, hopefully we can talk a little bit about that later in the discussion today. So back to what I would mention the very first P about policy. One of the things that we stress is the need for good evidence-based research to inform the public policy debate. And in November of last year at our annual conference, we launched a project, a research report called Tools for Today's Digital Parents. And we wanted to have a look at the role that parental controls play in the, in the lives of American parents and their children. And some of the things we wanted to learn were things like what do online safety tools uh, and what, what tools are available to parents today? And are parents using these tools? What experiences do parents and kids have with them? And what do parents like or dislike about those tools? Um, we also wanted to make sure that um, industry was able to meet the needs of parents. And we wanted to give them information about how they could improve the tools that they currently have. Now, in the process, in the throes of making uh, or doing this research, we actually had some one-on-one -on -one conversations with parents and we videotaped a few. Here's just a couple of very brief segments that I wanted to play for you. My concerns is just her taking in anything negative because she's such a nice person and I don't want the world or worldly things to saturate um, a, a kind heart. Bullying is like a teachable moment. If it happens, you can certainly deal with it after the fact, but um, things of a sexual nature are a lot harder to deal with after the fact. A predator is always my first concern. Um, the second concern is a different <clears throat> type of predator, just like the boys in her school. For some reason, boys these days are extremely manipulative and controlling and all the kids send each other nudes and look at porn and it's just a different world than when we were growing up. They can make their own choices. And that's part of it is having their agency to make. Oh, um, we seem to have lost the, uh, the video there. Let me see if we can uh, get back into that. Hold on a second. No. Well, um, I, I'm sure you could see that uh, some of the concerns that um, are shared certainly uh, in the APAC region from the survey that we done uh, that we did um, are, are shared by folks in the U.S. So let's let's take a look at the YouGov poll uh, that we conducted at the beginning of 2021, um, and this was uh, in India, Indonesia, the Philippines, and Thailand. So our goal was to look at each country's usage of parental controls and the perception of where the responsibility lies when it comes to managing one's online experience. And by the way, um, the survey poll can be found at our website at www.fozi.org. And um, I'll ask one of my colleagues to put the, uh, the link up in the Q&A section. And by the way, throughout this um, forum, if you have questions, for, uh, for me or for any of the other speakers, please use the Q&A function. All right, so the first question we asked was around responsibility. What or who do parents feel is the most responsible for children's safety and well-being online? And 
in the United States, 95% of parents acknowledge that they own some responsibility when it comes to digital parenting. But the ones who felt that they had the most responsibility um, were 57% of baby boomers, in other words, the older parents, 43% of Gen X, and 30% of millennials. And that's a pretty dramatic difference, by the way. Only half of millennials compared to baby boomers felt that they had the most responsibility for keeping their kids safe online. When asked further, they said, well, we feel that industry, government, educators all play a role in online safety. And quite frankly, we would agree. We talk about creating a culture of responsibility online. In the APAC region, 58% uh, of Indians said parents had the most responsibility. 68% of Indonesians, same for the Filipinos. And just over half of Thais felt that parents or caregivers were the ones with the most responsibility for keeping kids safe online. In terms of uptake, uh, how does the usage of parental controls and online safety tools compare? So 65% of US parents had rules in place uh, and sorry, 65% of parents with rules in place are using parental controls and online safety tools to help enforce them. So these rules are verbal rules or written rules that they have with their kids. Um, and out of those 65% also use parental controls. And interestingly, three out of four parents in the United States give themselves high marks for their conversations about online safety that they have with their kids. Now in the APAC region, um, we found some really interesting results. 74%, three out of four Indian parents say that they use one type of parental control. A full 90% of Indonesian parents said the same and 79% and 78% of Filipinos and Thais. So a really uh, a high level of use of parental controls in the region. Well, then we asked about concerns. You know, what were the leading concerns that parents had? And not surprisingly, uh, sexual content, bullying, um, but also their own child getting in trouble for inappropriate behavior we found in the US. And Interestingly too, millennial parents were far more likely to worry about their kids themselves getting into bad behavior. Um, and we think that's possibly because millennial parents grew up with the internet and are probably much more aware than say older parents are of the potential for risk of their kids acting inappropriately. Across the APAC region, we found a lot of unanimity about the concerns in India, Indonesia, and the Philippines around sexual content, violence, bad language. Um, but interestingly, in Thailand, um, there was concern about children spending too much time online um, and also having access to, child, to sexual content having a negative impact on a child's health. And so then we asked about where more support was needed. And about a quarter of Americans responded that they felt that industry could do much better. Um, currently rating them as only doing a fair to poor job of upholding their responsibilities in online safety. So a real message to industry that they really must do better. 57% um, of Indians felt that they needed more controls at both the device and the ISP level. 66% uh, of Indonesians simply wanted more controls at the device level. 72% of Filipinos the same. 62% of Thais wanting more controls at the level of their mobile phone or device. So we want to talk about um, what are the next steps throughout this conversation uh, this morning how can we best support parents? What types of collaboration are needed? Who should be at the table when talking about this? What are the challenges involved? And what are the opportunities? And I'll, I'll also end by saying that um, one of the things that 
we learned through talking to parents and to teens is there's a growing distinction between what we think of as parental controls, i.e. controls that parents set to limit where kids can go or the time spent online, as opposed to online safety tools, which are the tools that teens and young people use themselves to keep themselves safe or private when online or when using an app. So for instance, you know, to the ability to block uh, someone who is harassing them online, the ability to report on Facebook or Twitter, uh, the ability to restrict who can view their videos on YouTube or TikTok. And we're seeing that these young people see as empowering and really helpful, whereas their attitudes towards parental controls is usually not so positive. So that I'd be interested if um, we can talk a little bit about that as well today. So I'll stop there now. Um, I, I can happily take some questions if there are some, um, or we can move on because I believe uh, we do have a speaker that we were hoping to, uh, to join us um, earlier, and I believe he has joined us. So maybe I'll hand, uh, hand things back to you, Janina. Thank you, Stephen. Okay, so before we proceed with uh, the panel discussion, um, I'm going to call on Dr. Ismail Shah to give a short, uh, to give his speech to welcome us all uh, here today in this uh, event. Dr. Ismail Shah is the International Telecommunication Union Area Representative and Head of ITU Office for Southeast Asia and Timor-Leste. He is a renowned ICT professional and has extensive background in spectrum auctions, technology implementation, ICT policymaking, and regulations. Dr. Shah has also worked on initiatives for persons with disabilities, women empowerment, big data analytics, internet of things, shared economy, and digital entrepreneurship. Without further ado, uh, let's invite Dr. Ismail Shah. Thank you so much. I hope you can see my screen. So uh, I hope you can see my screen. Can anyone confirm? Yes, we can see it. Thank you. Thank you very much. So first of all, thank you to the organizer of this uh, very important event, a very uh, important topic. and. Uh, the International Telecommunication Union, which is actually the United Nations Specialized Agency for ICTs, Information Communication Technologies. Uh, we are very much aware of this important topic and we are doing a lot in this regard. Uh, our main uh, objective is to connect the people, but do it in a manner that is safe and secure. And as we can see from this figure that you can uh, that that I have displayed that uh, overall, even though, even though it's a little bit uh, dated, 2017, but overall you see that the young people are using the internet more uh, than uh, as compared to the overall population on the average. And that put them at, at risk also because there is content, there is behavior on the internet which can be very harmful for young people and children. So what are we doing in this regard as ITU? Uh, ITU has been working on uh, different guidelines and there are four sets of guidelines as you rightly identified uh, that the responsibility and you, you, you saw it through the surveys lies on many different stakeholders that include the parents, educators, children themselves, policy makers and the industry. So ITU uh, along with some partners like UNICEF had four guidelines for child online protection. And they have been revised uh, last year to include many new features and also to include uh, reflections on situations of children with disabilities and also taking into account the new technological developments that have happened over the last decade. So the first uh, guideline that we have, uh, it talks about how parents and educators uh, can help uh, the children to stay uh, safe online. Uh, 
so the guideline for parents and guardians it talks about having a discussion with the children and also to do some online exercises collectively together uh, it also talks about the technologies devices uh, and services that the whole family is using and uh, also to consider some blocking and monitoring program that can help the family uh, furthermore it talks about the expectation and the online dangers that are there for the educators also uh, the it provides guidelines related to making the devices secure password protected in the having the software the antivirus virus software installed and also the educators and schools and colleges to have the policies and related uh, technology and it also provides information uh, about that uh, children nowadays especially after after the pandemic are using internet a lot for learning and it's an essential part of the learning now you, they cannot just have uh, not have access to the internet it's very important that they have it however while doing that they may come across some uh, content which may not be appropriate for them so there should be an environment between the teachers and the parents and the uh, children so that they can talk to each other so the human to human dialogue despite all the technology that is available is a very important part of this whole issue of protecting children online similarly the industry also need to focus uh, in many different areas to keep uh, the children safe uh, they have a major responsibility as we saw in some of the surveys and that's why this guideline that we have for the industry uh, it looks into having the rights of the children uh, integrated into all the policies and manage management processes that the industry have uh, similarly if there is a situation uh, where we have the child sexual abuse material then we need to have a way to uh, for that to be uh, handled uh, there is this is also the responsibility of the policy makers to provide uh, access to age appropriate content while catering for the education and learning of the children and digital technologies uh, social media this can also uh, we should promote uh, they should promote the use of these technologies for creating civic awareness finally uh, the other important uh, the major actually stakeholders are the children themselves and for them we have uh, according to the age group of children different types of uh, activities uh, starting with storybooks like we have created a character known as Sangu and uh, there are many different uh, 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 scenarios for the children. This is mainly for children under the age of nine uh, to question uh, and, and uh, they provide, the children will provide the answers. For the children who are between the age uh, between nine and twelve, we have some uh, workbook exercises that has some educational material from where uh, they can learn similarly for children between uh, above 13 uh, we have a social media campaign which actually support them in the positive use of uh, the internet and having a positive online uh, experience so this has been adapted the child the the child online protection guideline for children has guidelines for different uh, children belonging to different uh, age groups and uh, finally we and the government also has a major responsibility in having uh, the policies and we can provide further information we believe as uh, i have been hearing in the, by the the talk by the first or the remarks by the first speaker it's only together that we can make a difference as the society as the policy makers as the industry and also to educate the children themselves and the parents and teachers also have a very important uh, responsibility uh, that they need to uh, discharge so thank you very much i'll stop here and uh, we can have questions later on or discussion or any other details that you would need for details you can also visit our website thank you so much
thank you so much, Dr. Ismail Shah, for that presentation and for the many insights. Again, we're encouraging everyone to please send in your questions or comments in the Q&A box anytime. Uh, right now, we will be proceeding to the panel discussion with various nonprofit organizations. So feel free to interact um, with our speakers for today. The discussion will be moderated by Amitabh Kumar, founder of Social Media Matters, headquartered in India. Amitabh Kumar is a gender rights activist. He is creator of Social Surfing and Twee Surfing, extensively working on resolving online, sorry, online safety issues with platforms like Facebook and Twitter, and also acts as an advisor to them concerning online safety of the users. Aside from leading discussions on online safety, he also imparts trainings on digital parenting and fake news. So everyone, here's Mr. Amitabh Kumar. Um, thank you, Janina. Uh, welcome to everybody to this extremely uh, important discussion. Uh, it's great to see uh, industry activists, um, thinkers come together on a platform like this. Um, uh, congratulations to um, you know the whole team of uh, Fossey and uh, Stephen, who's been uh, leading this uh, for many, many years, one of the mentors to me as well, and uh, many uh, activists working in this space. Uh, like Mr. Shah very clearly said, and rightly so, that uh, the last year has uh, emphasized how important the internet and the cyber world is. Um, it is beyond uh, entertainment and a pastime. It's a, a tool for our lives. It's a human right in many countries and rightly so. And some of the most important stakeholders of this uh, movement are uh, parents, uh, our children who are going to be um, the future and uh, hopefully positive digital citizens uh, contributing in a positive manner. Uh, while we look into uh, the movement of the internet, uh, it's, it's an educational tool. Uh, at the same time, it is also a marketing tool. And how do we find a balance uh, between the two is uh, extremely important. And one of the lines I usually use in my digital parenting workshops is uh, our children should use technology and not get used by it. And basically what we are looking into is uh, how we can use this extremely powerful medium positively. And uh, today with me uh, on the panel are some um, amazing people. Uh, Mr. Banyu Murthy from ICT Watch uh, Indonesia and uh, Ms. Lisa uh, from uh, FMA Female Philippines. And I look forward to discussing this point. Uh, just like many speakers said, uh, to all the viewers, please feel free to send in your questions uh, so that we can make it extremely uh, interactive. Um, without taking more time, uh, I would like to welcome you, uh, Banyu, uh, and let's see uh, your presentation uh, about uh, digital parenting and the situation in Indonesia. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Ami, and good morning, everyone. Uh, good evening for uh, Dr. Stephen. So uh, it is interesting to have the very insightful discussion for today. Let me share my screen first, okay. Okay, uh, I'm Banyu from my city was Indonesia and first of all, I want to express my gratitude and appreciation for FOSI for the remarkable works all this time, including this parental control survey in Asia with many of FOSI's guidelines uh, and I use guideline as well, that is my to train and educate parents in Indonesia. So I just want to share briefly about the portrait of Indonesia. As we all know that Indonesia is a big country that consists of thousands of islands, 100 cities and with 270 million population. In January 2021, uh, where Social and Hood Search also released the digital 2021 report that shown the numbers of Indonesian internet user and also social media uh, user. All these numbers show that we face some challenges, including the digital parenting issue. Actually, uh, I'm a little bit surprised uh, seeing the result of the parental control survey in Asia, uh, Dr. Stephen, that it's uh, mentioned that 90% of Indonesian parents 
use at least one of type of the parental control tool. Considering this number uh, above, uh, the considering the numbers that uh, Indonesian internet user, I think it's very big uh, percentage. So I think this is a challenge for us to do more effort actually for to educate parents in Indonesia. Uh, I want also want to share the Child Online Safety Index by the DG Institute that show us that one of the biggest challenges in Indonesia that we have to face is the guidance and education. Uh, because in this index, the score of Indonesia is very low. The scores measure a levels of parents' influence and instruction regarding children's media use and also the provision of education regarding online safety delivered by the school. So uh, I think this is one of the challenges that we have to face in Indonesia uh, regarding the, the, the uh, guidance and education. And also some main challenges that uh, we see in Indonesia. First, we haven't had the national digital literacy curriculum in formal education from K1 till K12. So the children in Indonesia then don't have a basic digital literacy competence while they are using technology intensively, especially during this pandemic. So the, the, the other one is parents sometimes does, doesn't know how to accompany their children in the digital world. As we all know that in this pandemic, they have to uh, sit side by side by, uh, in the, uh, with the children, with their children to do the uh, school, to do the homework, and it, it is uh, more challenging for most of the parents in Indonesia. And because we are a big nation, I can say that there is no one size fits for all solutions. We have a thousand scribes and local languages with a variety of cultures. The solution that can be implemented in Jakarta, in our capital city, our Surabaya, and one of the big uh, our big city may not be implemented in Aceh or Papua, uh, for instance. So when we educate some parents uh, on parental control, uh, for example, we also need to see the characteristic of the audience, where did they come from, the culture, the education level, etc. It's uh, become more challenging uh, to, to deliver the digital parenting education in Indonesia. And so what we can do? Uh, many initiatives that has been done in Indonesia. Uh, we do the multi-stakeholders collaboration between government, NGO, academy, private, technical uh, community, etc. Like Indonesia Internet Governance Forum. We have a digital literacy national movement, uh, and also uh, Indonesian ICT volunteer uh, that spread to into uh, many cities in Indonesia. But uh, one uh, that one that why I want to focus is the IBCOP, the Indonesia Child Online Protection for Child and Reputation Issues. Oh, it, it, this is a joint initiative, joint initiative involving multi-stakeholders with members from uh, Ministry of ICT, Ministry of Child uh, Online Pro Child Protection, and also the, the NGOs, uh, including ICT Watch. And last year, uh, the, end, the end of, yeah, last year on, on December, we tried to prepare a national roadmap uh, for child online protection. And it's still in the process of being finalized until now, and hopefully it can be uh, released in March. So uh, underline what the Dr. Stephen has also has already said that, yes, uh, we have to find um, many challenges, we have to find many opportunities and in the, in the challenges that we, have, that we face uh, to, to, to deliver more and more uh, educate uh, parents in digital parenting issue. I think that's it for me. Uh, back to Ami. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Ben, you for informing us. Uh, all that I can say is I completely echo what you are saying. Uh, that diversity of Indonesia is only replicated, if not more in India. So the one size fits all aspect uh, is not true. And that makes it complex for um, our governments as well as uh, the activists working in this space. And we'll discuss solutions further on the panel. Now I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Ms. Lisa uh, Garcia from FMAFM Philippines. 
uh, to um, share her thoughts and also focus on uh, what's the scenario in Philippines. So, Lisa. Okay, uh, thanks, Amitav. Um, hello, everyone. So my name is Lisa Garcia, and I'm the executive director of the Foundation for Media Alternatives, an NGO that works with different stakeholders uh, for uh, the strategic and appropriate use of information and communications technology for democratization and popular empowerment. So first, I would like to start uh, by sharing a background of my country. So like Indonesia, we are also an archipelago and we have a large population. Uh, we have 110 million population. And according to studies, um, uh, the internet penetration in the country is about 67% of the population, which would be roughly around 73 million individuals. And Filipinos, again, for this year, similar as to last year, Filipinos, again, uh, are the number one when it comes to um, spending more time in the internet. Um, according to the Hootsuite study, uh, Filipinos spend 10 hours and 56 minutes um, online. So we don't know whether they're just addicted, you know, to the using the internet or maybe it's because of the um, uh, very slow internet in the country. So we also have a um, very young population, uh, about more than a third of the population actually are children. And our Department of Education estimates that around 28 million are students. And with COVID-19, um, many schools have shifted uh, to online learning. But uh, when it comes to public elementary and high school, uh, high schools, it is still blended learning. So it's because not everyone would have uh, would be connected to the internet or would have devices. So uh, aside from the online learning, there's also the use of uh, printed modules among the students. So you can just imagine you know, with, with, with COVID-19, the amount of time that children spend online in front of their uh, computers, using their tablets or their smartphones. They are online for their studies, for consulting with their teachers, um, for getting information that they need for school or for other matters, for playing games, for entertainment purposes like watching um, shows at Netflix or socializing with, with families and friends whom they haven't seen physically. So much as um, parents would want to monitor the online activities of their children, it is impossible to do that all the time because they also have their own um, jobs, which some of them do online and other chores as well to attend to. Thus, parental controls are, are actually important. No? And, and there is valid reason why, why um, parents should be should, should worry when, when kids are uh, you know, left um, alone when, when they are you know, using the online space. Because several studies actually have, have shown that there are increasing risks as well as cybersecurity threats that kids are exposed to, such as bullying, you know, exposure to risky uh, content, you know, there's violence, vulgar language, et cetera. And Stephen actually mentioned it in, in his report that parents are actually uh, concerned about what their kids uh, see and watch online. So, and, and like um, Indonesia as well, when, when Banyu mentioned about the um, rank of Indonesia when it comes to online safety of children, uh, the Philippines, I think Thailand as well, uh, ranks low when it comes to best online safety for children. Now at FMA, what we've been doing is uh, we work on issues related to ICT. So we look at um, privacy rights, gender rights, and, and um, as well as digital security online. And these are some of the things that we share with, with our constituents. Um, at, uh, we also have been monitoring cases of online gender-based violence for several years now. And um, based uh, and, and we base this on, on the media reports that we see. And, and based on our observation, it's really a, a lot of young women, including girls, who are often victimized you know, from, from receiving threats, being bullied online, being stalked, having their images uh, posted online without their consent. And at the same time, there's also um, online child sexual exploitation. So there's a lot of risks there. and. Um, this pose harm as well, you know, when, when kids experience um, violation online. 
and um, this um, experiences uh, can lead to lower self-esteem, loss of confidence, um, and may lead to experiences of uh, mental and emotional stress on the individual kid. And in some extreme cases, we know that this can also lead to uh, suicide and, and we don't want that to happen. So what we're saying here is that parental controls, they do help, uh, they're necessary, but of course, uh, just as the other speaker said, this is not just, uh, this is just one of the solutions. Um, I'm glad that Stephen mentioned the three Ps, the uh, policies, practice, and parenting. That's important to remember. And yeah, and for parents, of course, uh, they, it is important as well to um, maintain, to sit down with their kids and maintain that communication with them to keep on talking to their children. As um, I, I remember this Af African uh, proverb, it says, it takes a village to raise a child. Even at the online space, it is not just parents who, need, who are necessary to be there to lead a child to grow uh, as a, a good citizen, but we also need other, other groups. We need the schools, the teachers to help, the platforms and the serv uh, and services apps, the industry can also help, as well as government through sound and effective um, policies. So that's it for now, um, Amit, thank you. Uh, thank you, Lisa, and uh, thanks for uh, that extremely um, informative uh, presentation. Um, and I totally hear you, parental controls and, uh, you know, uh, platforms like Netflix have been working really hard on them. They are becoming better uh, with every, uh, you know, uh, new um, version that comes out. Um, something that we see in India that though many solutions are being uh, developed uh, across the globe and uh, uh, industry partners are working very hard on creating a good safety solution, the awareness part of it is very, very low. So um, like we saw in the FOSTI research that a lot of Indian parents are aware of it. Um, the other side of it is many, many Indian parents are still not on the internet as well. So they are kind of coming on uh, uh, as the day passes by. Now, uh, and, and I would like to uh, uh, reach out to you, um, uh, Lisa, with this question that uh, uh, what do you see as the awareness level in the field when you are working with parents or when you're doing your research uh, about uh, the safety tools that are present? And uh, this could be across platforms, be it Netflix or any other. Um, uh, do they know of the solutions uh, that are being provided uh, to them uh, by the um, safety platforms? Okay, thanks for the question, Amit. Of course, um, when it comes to, to, to parental controls, it's important that uh, parents know what these are. Uh, I'm also glad that you mentioned that um, not a lot of parents, not all parents, not, not everyone, of course, is in the internet. And perhaps if these are parents from the urban areas, they might be more um, knowledgeable about the existence of parental controls the apps that you can download in the internet. But the, as the, um, the survey shows, that the one that Stephen mentioned, uh, there uh, most of the time um, in the Philippines, for instance, and I guess this is also the same um, in, in, in Indonesia and Thailand, uh, some of the controls that they use would include um, the use of uh, pins or passwords, and the filters as well. And then sometimes they rely actually on, on the devices. There are, are some controls there that they can use. Um, but then um, we should um, still continue informing parents, informing communities that this exists. Because while this, they are there already, um, there, um, the knowledge, uh, perhaps um, they haven't heard about it yet. So there should be an concerted effort among partners as well, uh, this group and, and our partners, we should share that there are such um, controls available, which we can use to help uh, ensure that there is um, safety for our children when they navigate the online spaces. Uh, Banu, um, looking into uh, the awareness part, um, uh, would also request you to uh, comment upon how the things are in the field in Indonesia, but also uh, what are uh, the problems 
that you are seeing, uh, which are there or which might be emerging in the future uh, when it comes to um, online safety and digital parenting? Yeah, I think same with India and also our Philippines that Indonesia have the uh, challenges in the, in, the, in the awareness about the digital parenting because uh, most of the parent thinks that the digital is the for uh, um, uh, their children era, their millennials, and and uh, sometimes they uh, take the distance for the, with this technology. So uh, that's one that we have to uh, more promoting that the important how uh, like Alisa said, we as a parent should sit next to the our children to monitor their activities uh, online uh, that that become uh, our challenge and now because uh, many of our parents think that uh, their 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 kid is more smart smarter and and then more 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 uh, uh, competence in the in the using this technology so uh, we have to 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 ask them ask ask their parents to to come on to join with your kids when they are in the digital uh, technology, and the like uh, for the for the like like uh, also mentioned that we can we can see that the the challenges the the, the negative impact in for internet for the children is like an iceberg. If we see the part uh, the parental control uh, survey, we see that most of uh, parents think that the pornographic content and also the negative content is the biggest problem for the, their children. But actually, in the bottom line, uh, under the uh, water, um, still many of uh, things that we have to see about the child uh, online safety, like like the privacy, uh, the hoax, etc. So yeah, I think that's the one that we have to uh, uh, see in the, in the future, I mean. Uh, certainly, and, and and taking this question forward to you, Lisa, uh, I saw that you know through the survey as well, parents are concerned about uh, some of the traditional issues, which is uh, sexual content, violence, abusive language. Internet with itself has some emerging issues which did not exist prior to the internet, uh, and I was wondering um, how is the situation in Philippines and um, how are the parents approaching these new issues such as. Uh, be it cyberbullying or like we heard in uh, the video shared by Stephen from Fossey that, uh, you know, they are, it's a new generation. They're sharing nudes, they're interacting. So uh, how do uh, people approach it, uh, you know, uh, in, the, in the Philippines? Of course, we all know that um, in as much as we would want to be protected when we are in the offline space, online space, we should also treat it that way. There is There are also a lot of predators there. We all should also be um, concerned about our safety, our privacy as well when we are online. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes we forget this because uh, we think um, that uh, it's nice to be online. Um, I, I remember before no, when we were talking to children, um, they were actually um, comparing the number of friends that they have on Facebook without realizing they don't even know half of this uh, 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 friends, so-called friends that they have. Of course, that, ha that has changed eventually because there have been campaigns and focuses in the country by, by other groups, children's groups that uh, revolving around these issues. What we're saying is that we should be uh, taking care of our um, online um, safety. And I agree with Banyu when he said that, you know, children these days are very tech savvy. And there have been studies as well saying that uh, some children, especially when they reach a certain age, they start keeping secrets already from, from their parents. That's why it's important for parents also to sit down with their children, see what they are doing online, learn from their children as well. Because sometimes, you know, they are more, children are even more experienced than their parents when it comes to the tech stuff. Uh, totally. I mean, um, India presents the same scenario. Uh, we have a lot of parents who are very proud about, uh, you know, how, how tech savvy their children are. Uh, and at times we have to highlight that they are still children. So decision making is something that you, they have to learn from uh, their parents, teachers and uh, family. Uh, 
And another aspect is that um, technology uh, for uh, young kids, the digital natives, as we call them, is uh, not a different part, but a part of their life. Uh, it is something they are living with. Their online friends at times are just as real as their offline friends. Uh, the likes matter, um, the, uh, the, the comments matter, uh, and uh, their relationships have a very strong uh, uh, online um, uh, you know, presence. If they don't get a, a birthday cake virtually, they, are, they become unhappy. So it is definitely different. It's a tectonic shift. And uh, looking at this shift, uh, I was uh, wondering if uh, um, digital families uh, and uh, Stephen spoke about policy practices and parenting. Uh, if you had to pick, uh, you know, top three practices that you would like to advise to uh, parents in your country, because parenting is also a very cultural aspect. It's not universal. Uh, what would those, uh, you know, really uh, uh, three tips be? Or, or they could be more as well. So uh, starting, who would like to go for first, Banu or Lisa, uh, to the parents in your country? I think so I need maybe, to put one. Lisa, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I'll just start. Okay. I think I, I've shared it um, already. Um, of course, we were saying that kids sometimes are more savvy with when it comes to technology than their um, parents. So, number one, parents should also um, keep up with with technology and learn with their kids. Discuss what the issues are there. So, be be friends with your kids as well. But you also have to realize that you are the adult. You are the parent, and and sometimes uh, there are rules you, you, that that they have to uh, that children have to follow because parents have the experience they experience being kids and growing up, and they know what it is um, to be offline and online as well. So um, and then again, of course, sitting down with with their children and discussing things, I think that would be very important. And again to highlight uh, parents should look into what is there, the technology that is there that can help them in, in um, guiding their children, whether it's setting up privacy settings, et cetera. Okay, uh, maybe just at some point from the Lisa, uh, I always use the seven step to good digital fronting for C when, when I talk with the parents. Uh, first of all, we how you can build your bonding with your the children, talk with your children, uh, make a good communication with them. That's that the um, uh, the point, uh, the main point that we have to uh, share with with the parents. And then, uh, like uh, Lisa said, that we have to educate ourselves. We, as a digital immigrant, have to catch up with. The, our children uh, as a digital native. This this one is 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 uh, uh, important, and also uh, we have to catch up with the technology uh, as well. Use the parental controls. Uh, how to use uh, social media? Uh, what kind of games that uh, our uh, children uh, play, etc. And and also uh, uh, how can we how we can the the make the, the this media this 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 internet this uh, digital technology as a media for play with the children we have to explore we have to share we have to celebrate uh, the with this media with 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 with, with uh, this uh, digital technology with uh, with the, our children so uh, i think that's that's the point that uh, i want to share with the parents in indonesia Uh, thank you, thank you. Um, uh, on that celebratory note, a little bit of celebration for us as well. Uh, uh, Mr. Rakesh Maheshri from the Indian government and the ministry has just joined us. So I think uh, Janina, he will be doing his presentation as uh, uh, he had... uh, I'll just uh, wait for uh, Janina to give in. Um, within the same uh, period, uh, the, the three important points from uh, my side would be um, the why. It's extremely important why you're using a certain technology app or tool. Uh, technology is a part of your life and not 
your life uh, completely. So that is also extremely important for parents to uh, highlight. And like Banu said, the celebration and the positivity part, it has to add to positivity in your life. So these are the three major aspects that I leave uh, uh, digital parents with to our workshops in India. Yeah, sure that uh, uh, they um, stick to these practices. So, um, uh, Janina, would you like to come in? Yes, uh, thank you, Amitabh, and of course, to all the speakers of the NGO panel, um, Mr. Banyu and Ms. Lisa. So, before we proceed to the industry panel discussion, we'll have a quick message from Mr. Rakesh Meshwari, Senior Director of Cyber Loss Group of the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology, Government of India. This ministry is the custodian of IT Act and hence deals with internet-related policies. They have been working closely for social also for the video on-demand platform. So, um, Mr. Rakesh, please take it away. So, thank you, Jenna. Thank you, Amitabhji. And thank you, Josie Fosi, for uh, inviting me in this program of digital literacy in the streaming era. And in fact, allowing me to join in, I mean, at the time when I wanted. So thank you very much for the same. I'll just like to mention that India is as a huge country with uh, 1.4 billion population. And we are the country where the internet data rates are the minimum across the world. And it is primarily because of this and the fact that as a trend, as a technological trend, the, the over the top uh, video on demand platforms, streaming platforms are becoming more and more popular and particularly so during the pandemic period when practically everything else is shut down and the children are resorting to our children are being forced to do the online learning. I mean, and, and that, that's, a, that's a great, I mean, indirectly an opportunity as well, which is what has come to them uh, to at least become much, much more familiar with all those online tools, technologies available to them. And as part of internet, I mean, as part of entertainment, definitely OTT players, have played a significant role. And this is where we are expecting the OTT industry, which is comprising of more than 40 players as of today, to grow at a much, much faster rate. However, from a, now I, I just try to, I mean, uh, develop the context, develop the problem statement that while this ministry, my ministry, Ministry of Electronics and IT deals with online policies, we actually do not deal with the content. So content is supposed to be everybody else's job in the country. It may be law enforcement agencies. It may be the corresponding agencies who are doing it I mean, uh, in, in the physical world. And unfortunately, the laws of physical world for that reason are not really, in many scenarios, not up to the mark, particularly when dealing with the online situations. And therefore, we realized that there is a near vacuum of regulatory framework in India. India, as you may be aware, is a country of, I should say, multi-state, multi multi-religion, multi-ethnic, multi-languages, and therefore we are a country of variety. We have, uh, I mean, historically, I mean, uh, we, we, we happen to be a bit conservative vis-a-vis -vis what the Western world would expect us to be. Because of this rapid growth of uh, OTT platforms, we realized that standardization of content rating is something which is missing. I mean, while, while most of the platforms are adopting the, the content rating standards, 
Unfortunately, the standards being followed by these different uh, players happen to be different. And the, so is the case of content descriptor. Child safety in any case remains one of an important issue for us. And we believe that awareness of the child, I mean, age rating, age gating filters, and the technological tools which these platforms need to deploy must be in sync. And therefore, and therefore, the challenge had been as to how do we have create the awareness among children and have the uniform implementation of the content rating standards, the content descriptors, and uh, I, mean, I mean, the fact that they should be clear enough, good enough to be able to convey all that is required to be conveyed before they, they come on to the scene and, and, and the program starts. So therefore, government, as I said, being conscious of this fact, we, uh, first of all, started with uh, looking for the various options. Ministry of Information and Broadcasting in India has been conventionally the ministry which looks at all, looks at all these issues in the offline world. And therefore, the first thing which we did was that the allocation of business rules. So, so the way a, a ministry works is based on certain allocation of business rules. And we therefore added that even in the online world, for the similar kind of content which were being delivered in the offline world, maybe the methodology was different, the technologies were different, maybe the content, the way they were being consumed were different, but still, the, this is the ministry which understands the context, the content, the best as compared to any other ministry. And that's how Ministry of I and B has already been onboarded. And both our ministry dealing with the online issues, online policies, and the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting dealing with or having a good oversight of the content related issues, we have come together like merging of technologies and merging of, uh, I should say, convergence of technologies. It is the convergence of two ministries for a particular cause, which is what has happened today. Like any other country, we are a democratic country. We value, I mean, our constitution values uh, freedom of speech and expression, which is a fundamental right in the country. However, there are certain reasonable restrictions, particularly in the context of national security, our relations with the foreign countries, security of the state, uh, and scenarios which can cause public order. As I said, we being a multi, multi, multi kind of country, we are a sensitive country as well. So, so the solution therefore we believe is that the content rating should be based on the local needs and should be standardized. In fact, ideally, I mean, the, the country being so big, Actually, the content rating can be even at the state level, but definitely it should be at a country level. So that's the, I mean, that's uh, the thing that we are going, I mean, we are working closely with Ministry of I and B to come up with standards, to come up with guidelines for the industry in respect of the content rating and the content description uh, descriptors. Awareness, I believe, is a joint responsibility of the parents, the platforms, the schools, and the government. I believe that in this particular, in this era of internet, it is actually the children who know more than what their parents know. And therefore, putting those age, age filters for the various kinds of contents, sometimes it is children who do it for their parents. And therefore, maybe whatever you may do, finally, children also have the access of the same contents as what their parents would ideally, I mean, may not like them to have. And this is what is one of the problem which I had been discussing with uh, various OTT platforms, including Netflix people, that one thing which they need to do, I mean, in addition to the to happen, I mean, coming out with age ratings, coming out with pin controls, kids profile, all said and done. The fact remains that the platforms do have a major responsibility in ensuring and in educating and in creating awareness time and again in the parents that the content which is suitable for a particular age group 
is consumed by that age group or maybe maybe i mean of course the higher age group can always be doing it so the government of india therefore is working with the industry to come up with some light touch regulation we do expect that there should be a robust framework at the organizational level at the ott platform itself which is what we will be calling as the level 1 uh, i should say self control mechanism the industry we had also been encouraging them to come up with industry associations so uh, in fact uh, i have been once again closely involved in getting that code developed as well so that will be the industry level self regulation model and government intervention at of course at, at both these levels in a way will be minimum but certain guidelines particularly in terms of the commitment to all the commitment to share in a very transparent transparent manner the grievances received and the way they are being redressed even i mean at the at the company level at the uh, self regulating industry uh, level is what is important to us and the government will like to intervene only in extreme cases where where the scenario is likely to create a public order or maybe because of the hostile borders that we have sometimes there is a, a, a national security issue as well of course from government side we have already been i mean having a number of programs initiated from our uh, i mean from our ministry from ministry of home affairs we have uh, we have a, a portal where things can be reported we have been i mean trying to integrate the modules with the schools particularly on e safety we have been uh, in fact we are we have already i mean launched a scheme for uh, enrolling students for more and more cyber volunteers to be able to report contents i mean so so the thing is not just restricted to the ott platforms it's it's going beyond so that's how the scenario is and hopefully the way that we are working with ministry of ind as on today maybe very soon you may have the light touch regulations being formally launched in india thank you very much thank you so much mr rakesh for that um, very insightful uh, message uh, right now we will be proceeding to the industry panel discussion may i welcome stephen balkan back on screen to moderate the discussion well thanks very much and and my gratitude also to mr rakesh i thought that was a particularly interesting uh, presentation i hope uh, you can see me here um yeah i can and thank you very you much <laughs> thank you yeah. thank, thank you, you so Stephen. much for coming and yeah. by the way um i don't know if i met you at the time but uh, i've been to india now a couple of times and um actually at one point uh, got to see the minister of women and children development uh, mrs gandhi when she was there uh and and had the priv privilege and honor to meet with her and know that um she and the rest of the ministry share your interest and concern about reaching parents about educating children uh and and also for that matter bringing industry together um to uh to, to create greater safeguards for for children so thank you very much really appreciated that um i'm now going to introduce um the next panel uh and in fact well quite frankly i'm going to ask them to introduce each uh, themselves as they join us um john medeiros uh, are you there i don't see your video oh, there you are um <laughs> welcome i was lurking <laughs> you were lurking john why don't you introduce yourself and uh take us through a little bit about um your background and the uh background of your uh, organization okay um let me show a few uh slides that will hopefully be helpful in that uh okay uh so my name is john medeiros and i'm the uh chief policy officer of asia video industry association um what you can see on your screen now are the logos of our 75 member companies who are all active in 
the video industry in Asia. Video for us means both uh, traditional modes of distributing video to consumers, streaming video to consumers, TV channels conveyed over cable and satellite broadcasting systems, over mobile John, phones. John, and but yeah. John, if I may, you're actually not showing that. You're showing a screen that has uh, Zoom video conferencing written all over it. Is that what you meant to show us? Whoa. No, that's not it. Uh, hang on one <laughs> second here. So. Stop that. Let's see if you can get uh, your you uh, PowerPoint up there. Yeah. Oh, OK. Let me, uh, no. Hmm. Well, this working before, didn't we? Uh, OK, let me try again. Now, is that? Uh, you're, now you're showing us your work documents. How's that? No, you're, you're sh oh, there you go. There you go. Thank you. OK, all right. Apologies and thank you for alerting me, Stephen, before I uh, before I went on to all the rest of this. Um, yeah, so we're an association. We're in the video industry, traditional video, and also online video now. So um, a rapidly growing part of video consumption by consumers in Asia. Uh, what do we do? We advocate for the video industry. We're dedicated to reducing video piracy, and we uh, are the, the trade association for the video industry and ecosystem in the Asia Pacific. So that's who we are and what we do. Um, I, we're short of time, so I'm going to move pretty quickly into this uh, description here. Uh, the online curated content services are out of online content. Uh, curated content comes from many different countries. It's copyright protected, so the services that use it pay the creators for their work. Uh, personalized and very consumer centric, and it has varied revenue sources. Subscriptions are important, but low income consumers also like the freemium model and uh, ad funded services. Um, consumers like online content because it gives them choice convenience. it provides family control for um, um, for for uh, members of families who are not adults to uh, to be guided by their parents um, and it comes at of course varied price points I, I would distinguish online curated content from the um, the other kinds of online content. we all tend to talk about online video content but the the business models, while the technology is the same, that everybody everybody plugs in and can see all the content, the business models and the way that the different sectors operate uh, are very different. Um, and you've got social media, you've got user-generated content. People have uh, access to uh, all kinds of material, which is you know not controlled by the companies that operate the platforms. In our case. The content that is put up on the platform is controlled by the company, and our um, our goal is to be responsible members of the communities where we operate. Uh, just so you get an idea of the order of magnitude uh, in Asia, because uh, advertising supported video on demand, which the consumer does not pay for, is so uh, prized by consumers. Uh, in Southeast Asia, you can see the huge difference between the consumption of video on YouTube, which is an advertising supported service, the biggest one, but not the only one, and the companies in our side of the industry, companies like Netflix or View TV, which is based in Hong Kong and works throughout this region, Video, which is the Indonesian, one of the Indonesian platforms, the biggest one there. So you can see that uh, we're not the biggest part of the internet, uh, but we think we are the safest and the most responsible. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Consumers choose our services because they can pick the time of viewing. They have control over their content and their family's content, and it's portable. They can take it on the go. They can watch it wherever they want. These are uh, from some research done in various countries a couple of years ago by the consulting firm Alpha Beta. Um, we 
the con control over content in that slide refers to individual control over what they watch and when, as well as parental control. And we have also done some survey research. I'm not going to show too many of those slides because not surprisingly, the views held by consumers that came out in our research were very much like the views that came out in FOSI's research. So I'm, I'm not going to go over that uh, again. Uh, but our goal as an industry association has been to recognize the consumer demands revealed by surveys like ours and like FOSI's and like others, and to encourage OCC services throughout Asia to take steps to provide a safer environment for consumers and their families, certainly safer than the internet as a whole. We want our services to be trusted by families uh, and by governments um, to give consumers what they're asking for in a socially responsible way. So we've issued a governance framework for OCC services. We have no ability to bind companies in the industry, but it's a fact that our members who are the largest and best known service providers across the region have all endorsed the approaches outlined in this governance framework, which constitutes benchmarks, references for the industry to use in Asia going forward. This was just issued uh, last uh, November. Um, without going into too much detail, what's in the governance framework is commitments by the industry to provide safety by design and parental controls on services uh, to provide wherever possible program ratings, uh, which can inform consumers, help them understand uh, the content, what is in the content that they're choosing for their, for their families. Um, we call on the industry to make provision for effective consumer feedback. That's another part of the governance framework. Uh, we don't want to be anonymous companies floating somewhere in the cloud who are hard to reach. Consumers need to know how to contact their service providers and should be able to expect answers back. Um, and then the framework talks about what's not to be found on our platforms, and that's prohibited content. You're not going to find child pornography or any pornography for that matter. You're not going to see content that incites terrorism or calls for violence against segments of the population. And of course, you're not going to see content that violates intellectual property rights. So um, uh, that's a, a benchmark for what consumers should not find on online curated content services. Those are important red lines for our responsible media services. And of course, we do have some asks for governments. Um, we think that high regulatory barriers negatively affect the growth and investment that's coming from this industry. Um, on the other hand, we don't want to avoid regulators and try to be anonymous, but there has to be for governments to get in touch with OCC services easily if they have a problem. But the best way to achieve that is for governments to require notification by OCC services of basic information so that companies tell governments, we're here, we're operating in this market, and this is how you can reach us so we can discuss any issues that might arise. It's all about transparency and about open lines of communication. All right, uh, that's my intro. I hope that wasn't too John, long. Uh, I'll be happy to talk to you for a in the Q&A session. Thank you, that was perfect. That would really help to set us up and uh, take on. And I meant to say at the beginning, what a really good progression we've had, uh, starting with the ITU, which is of course an intergovernmental organization, then to hear from uh, three excellent nonprofits in the region, never mind um, hearing directly from parents too through the survey results. And now we're getting to hear from industry mm. itself. And, and you're starting from a, a, a sort of trade association level. And now we get to drill down into two uh, companies uh, and, and their practices. Um, so next I wanna invite uh, Shanta, Shanta Aral from Netflix to uh, introduce yourself, Shanta, tell us who you are and tell us uh, what it is that uh, Netflix is doing in this space. You may be on mute. Hi, not... hi, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. 
All right, let me just uh, see if you can see my slides. Can you see that? Yes, Netflix in a nutshell. Okay, great, perfect. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Shanta. I'm from Netflix. I'm the Director of Strategy and Development on the Public Policy Team. So um, we're really excited to be here today talking about parental controls. Um, it's, it's really pertinent to us and Netflix for, um, for, for Netflix, what we're trying to do as an online curated content service is to ensure that we offer consumers choice convenience and control. Oops. All right, here we go. So we're offering choice, convenience and control to our consumers. Um, when we talk about choice, what we're talking about is really the range of content that we have, TVs, films, documentaries, kids content. Uh, when we talk about convenience, uh, what we really want to do is ensure that consumers have a seamless experience. So that means having no ads, ensuring that there's uninterrupted viewing, not having buffering, and we even ensure that consumers are able to cancel anytime they want. When it comes to controls, which has really been the pertinent discussion for today, um, what we want to be able to do is ensure that we are empowering consumers with the right controls and technologies to ensure that they have an informed decision as they're making their content choices. When we think about families, we really feel like all families are different. Um, you know, I think many of us are very used to the experience of um, needing our, our kids to be able to watch Netflix or some other entertainment show on a mobile device while we're trying to scarf our lunch down. For other parents, the experience is really about watching together, watching a film with your whole family sitting on the couch. Um, we know that for different parents, they have different considerations when they think about what's appropriate or not appropriate for their kids. So at Netflix, the focus for us is really about two things, ensuring that we're investing in a whole lot of best in class kids and family content. Um, and as you can see here with Mighty Little Beam, that's an amazing Indian animation show um, that we launched last year that's been watched by millions of consumers around the world. And on the other hand, is really about parental controls. How do we make sure that consumers can make informed decisions? How do we make sure that parents have peace of mind um, so that they have a service that they can watch, but their kids, they're comfortable with their kids also watching. And within that space, we have things like a kid's dedicated profile where kids can navigate safely and are only really watching age appropriate content. We have ratings and we also have profile level pin controls, um, which was really a result of feedback we were getting from our consumers. Um, a parent can set a pin on their uh, profile so that they can watch um, in their own time and space the content that they'd like to watch. And if their kids were trying to access their profile, they would not be able to because the pin, um, pin lock would be up. And I think one of the key things that everyone's been raising during this discussion is really about awareness. Um, how do we make sure that parents understand the parental controls? How do we raise awareness so that they um, you know, can address some of the digital divides that were discussed today between um, parents and their kids? And we're very excited today to be launching step-by-step uh, -step guides for our parental controls, um, which we have localized across languages in APEC. So they will be out in Vietnamese, in Bahasa Indonesia, in Hindi, in Korean. We really want to reach parents where they are in their own language and help them navigate how you set up parental controls with assets that they can share on social media, on WhatsApp, Netflix checklists um, that would enable them to look up all the different things that they need to do to set up their parental controls um, in the right way. And we're really excited to be partnering with the various organizations here today, um, FMA, FOSI, Social Media Matters, ICT Watch, who will help to distribute these assets um, and continue on that effort to raise awareness um, and education about parental controls. And Stephen, there was something in your US research and insights presentation that really talked about a one-stop shop for all these parental controls education. And we would love to be part of those initiatives as they develop in APAC. 
So thank you very much for having us here and I'm looking forward to the panel discussion. Great, Shanta. And, and thanks again for all of the work that uh, you've done in your team to, to make today possible. Really, really appreciate that. Um, and last but certainly not least, I want to bring in Wen Chi Yu uh, from VIP Kid, also a member of FOSI, which we're very grateful for. Wen Chi, tell us about yourself and um, some of the work that you guys are doing in this space. Yeah, sure. Thank you for inviting me. Hi, my name is Wen Chi Yu. Um, I'm the head of global public policy with VIP Kid. So um, I also have a um, a very uh, quick PowerPoint to share with everyone. Just bear with me. Can everyone see that? Nope. Huh. Share screen has failed to start. Um, uh, let me just try again. Can you see that? Yep. yep. Okay, great. All right. So, um, if you haven't heard about VIP Kid, um, we are a global online classroom that basically connects students and teachers through personalized learning. And we connect different cultures around the world um, for the purpose of inspiring the passion for lifelong learning. Um, our founder is Cindy Mi, uh, who is a very young entrepreneur. She herself um, was an English tutor before. So how does that work? Um, on one hand, we have right now about 800,000 students using our platform, um, aged between three to 15 um, from around 60 different countries. And the majority of them are based in China. And on the other hand, we have about 100,000 tutors, um, English tutors based in North America. And um, they have at least bachelor's degree. They have at least two years of teaching uh, experience and one third of them have uh, graduate uh, education and lots of teaching experience. And so VIP Kid, uh, we basically play the role of connecting them. We provide the platform and we pre prepare a lot of materials from pre-classroom videos to immersive one-on-one -on -one English classroom to post-classroom homework. Um, we are the ones who design the platform. It's a closed platform, so obviously you have to be either a student, a parent, or a teacher in order to access our platform. So in that sense, we're different from, for example, Netflix or other um, social media platforms, which may be more open, and that gives us more control of how our platform can be managed in terms of safety. Um, and of course, um, we can talk more about the, the actual features we have um, on the platform to ensure children's safety. Um, we don't use as many parental controls because again, our online platform is already designed to be more safe in and of itself. However, obviously, because it's live streaming between an online tutor and a student. So, whether student behavior, teacher behavior, what they say, um, that needs more attention. And we do have innovative features that um, we can share later. And I, you know, heed um, Stephen's advice, basically only give a three minute uh, opening introduction. And here are some of our partners. Obviously without them, uh, we would not have achieved um, how we do this online classroom. And of course, we're a proud member of FOSI, um, which has allowed us to really learn from other industry players and leaders on how to do this as a business. Uh, we believe that you know doing this is really good for ourselves and our customers, um, both students as well as teachers. And it is our responsibility 
um, to make sure that you know online classroom is the safest place. So I'll stop here. Well, thank you so much for that, Wenchi. Uh, really, a, a speed dial through your uh, the, the work that you do, and and to, I think to be fair, I'll start with you and 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 throw you the first question, but welcoming back the rest of the panel. Um, so talk a little bit about how VIP Kid mitigates the stuff that can happen in an online classroom. And how does AI, human moderation, other things play a role in doing that? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so if you think about a classroom, I think, um, can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. So if you think about uh, a classroom, there are basically three components. One is teacher, uh, second is curriculum, and the third is students. So that's basically the three most important elements of the online classroom. So starting with curriculum, obviously, because everything is designed by us, you know, everything is sort of uh, screen to make sure the content is very appropriate. And the tutors are strongly encouraged to follow the curriculum. So they don't, you know, provide other things or say things that are content inappropriate. Uh, so that's number mm -hmm. one. Number two, in terms of teachers, right? So how do we ensure that the teachers that are teaching students give parents the peace of mind? So the number one thing is, you know, all of them, in addition to having the educational qualification, they also need to have for example, clean background. So criminal background check um, is something we take seriously. Um, and then and then the third component uh, that's what's interesting is, um, so who is there since it's online to make sure that everything happens um, is, is appropriate and safe? Um, we actually have several features. So one thing I wanna mention is, um, firemen, so we call them firemen. They're the ones who actually monitor the classes um, live. And these are, we have hundreds of firemen who handle um, on average about 140,000 classes that are taking place on a daily uh, basis. And uh, about 100 classes per day would rise up to firemen's um, sort of attention. So. Usually it's IT, but also crisis management. Um, and usually those incidents happen when, um, for example, teachers find that, you know, students could be doing things that harm themselves, um, playing guns, even though it's like a toy gun, um, or could be swallowing things that are not, um, that don't seem, um, you know, safe for them, or they could witness, for example, some, um, you know, child disciplinary issues or even domestic violence. So that's when physically intervention is not possible. Um, and they have this, um, we, have, we have designed this critical safety button for teachers. They can press that button um, and then firemen will pay attention to them right away um, and will of course alarm the parents. Um, so that's something, you know, innovative we developed to make sure everything is um, instant. And the last part is actually about student behavior. So it's not just teachers or it's not just, you know, um, a sort of teachers who may have inappropriate behavior. Students could have that too. Um, and some of it is cultural, unintentional. For example, you know, kids with their iPad, they may bring it to the bathroom, um, which, you know, teachers certainly don't want to see. Um, and, and in that case um, also, um, uh, we have, you know, teachers who can use the critical safety button to alarm um, what's going on. Now, in terms of teachers' behavior, if it's inappropriate, what do we do? Um, so there are two things we can do. One is we actually have a, um, a, a function for parents uh, that they can monitor those classes live. So some parents actually, you know, we do not encourage them to be lurking in the background when the kids are taking classes, um, but they can monitor those classes online. They can even, uh, we also have the video recording function that they can watch the playback um, afterwards. Um, so that's one thing. And the second is the firemen. Again, um, while a fireman cannot be 
monitoring every student um, so carefully, that's when AI actually plays a critical role. Um, so AI actually monitors to ensure that our young learners um, you know, are safe online. And they're only used to really, you know, identify, for example, you know, behavior at risk. Um, or, you know, sometimes, especially with regards to um, teachers um, mm -hmm. behavior. So these are some of the examples. Um, in a nutshell. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Um, Shanta, I want to come to you now. And, you know, we, and we've heard a lot about parental controls and settings and things, but how can how can industry and how can you as a company um, demystify things like parental controls and settings for parents? What um, what steps can you guys take? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question, John. And I think for us, we're constantly looking to improve the service, and part of that means seeking feedback from our members, from our partners, to get the best experience for our members and deliver on the needs that they have. So last year, for example, when we updated our parental controls, it was really based on feedback um, that maybe a title level pin was not sufficient and we needed to have profile level pins. Um, and it's something that we actioned on. And we get these inputs from a range of sources. Like I mentioned, we speak to our members, we talk to people in focus groups, our partners. And one of the other things that we've heard a lot of feedback on was about the need for more education and raising awareness of the parental controls. Um, so that's why we were rolling out the step-by-step -step guides today in a way that can reach um, parents where they are in their own language and, and help to demystify some of the things that are already available but that people may just not know about. And of course, part of the work also is working with the NGOs and other organizations who are here um, because they are really plugged in with parents um, and our members and so can also help spread the message um, locally in a really effective way. Brilliant. Um, John, yeah, you know, can I, yeah, yeah, can yeah. I address uh, the point that that Shanta was just making, because uh, I think it's interesting that as an industry, the benchmark that we have tried to set for network, Netflix is already ahead of the curve, but we want the other players in the industry as well to uh, make parental controls or content filters an integral part of the design of online viewing software, creating um, safety by design so that default settings are such that parental controls are enabled by default and mm -hmm. activated by consumers during the first sign-on procedure. Then if you have an all adult household, you can disable them, but to start with them in default mode. And I think that that's an important part of the education process that needs to be built into the consumer experience from the beginning. It says to consumers, these systems are here, they're set up for you, please use them. Right. John, um, I want to stay with you because you heard from um, Dr. Meswari, uh, sorry, Mr. Meswari earlier from India. Um, and as a regulatory person, you know, he's trying to get his head around this. How do you guys think about the new demands that regulators have in this new space, as opposed to, say, traditional television and the regulating of programs? Well, we, we are uh, strong advocates for regulatory reform. Uh, I don't think that will surprise anybody. You know, the, the traditional TV industry had characteristics that are uh, very different from uh, those of, of online viewing. I mean, a traditional TV broadcasting mode, the household had a TV if it was on or it was easy to turn on, and then the content came. There was no consumer choice involved in, in selecting that content, which is obviously very different from, um, on the one hand, pay TV, where the consumer is selecting content at the level usually of, of opting for channels or not, and then online content where the consumer is actually pulling the individual piece of content down. So you need to, um, we, we tell governments that they need to take account of the but very different uh, characteristics um, in uh, in this uh, new uh, new technological area that, that we are talking about. And of course, the sector is marked by ongoing innovation and development of new offerings. Um, at the same time that it's in a life or death competitive battle with 
what I will call the dark side of the internet, the piracy uh, ecosystem in particular and parts of the social media e ecosystem, which actually show anything and everything. Mm -hmm. um, so government should want to see the curated, the innovative curated services succeed and should not regulate the services just because they are the easiest, the most accessible, put it that way. Um, they need to carefully balance the, uh, a pragmatic and, and market-based approach with, uh, with their desires. You know, too many of the legacy rules for broadcasting were tied to what used to be an advertising monopoly that was basically enjoyed by free-to-air television. Um, well, clearly that doesn't exist anymore. If there are, uh, if there's market power, it's not monopolies uh, in FTA anymore. There, there may be some online. Um, so we are supporting regulatory approaches that are tailored to the, the real viewing conditions experienced by consumers, as I say, especially when they're pulling um, the content themselves. We have tech tools now that never existed back in the old analog television vision days. Um, and those tech tools, we've been talking about some of them, the parental controls, filters, they exist now to help and empower parents. Um, and we think government should adjust their approaches to rely on those tools, rather than to wield ancient regulatory sledgehammers designed in the 1950s, um, in the form of strict censorship that just drives consumers into the darker reaches of the internet. All right. Okay. Thank you for that. And thanks for sharing your screen there. Yeah, um, I want to, sorry, I meant to turn it off. There that's <laughs> okay. Um, Wenchi, let me come back to you because I think what's fascinating about the IP Kid is the cross-cultural element within it. So how do you address safety and communication in a setting where you have maybe a teacher from the Midwest of America talking to a family and to a child in Beijing um, with some pretty big cultural differences there. How, how do you, or how do your firemen and women deal with those sorts of issues? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Actually, we're dealing with it on a daily basis and every day there are you know, tens of hundreds of cases. Um, and the definition of safety and the idea of safety may be different um, from a teacher and, and a student too. So that's why we think it's critical for us to place a role that is appropriate. Um, so let me give you an example. Um, we created certain educational videos um, that target both parents as well as students because we do see certain issues that have come up uh, frequently. And I'll give you some example. Um, for students in particular, um, bring your iPad to bathroom. It happens so frequently that, <laughs> that um, it, it, it's something that we created an, uh, an animated video that um, is played for every new student when they are newly on board. Um, and it's a very easy message for the students to see. And it's a reminder, literally a reminder for them. Remember not to bring your iPad when you go to your bathroom. Um, and so, and we use our mascot to, to sort of um, convey the message. Um, and there are also educational videos for parents. I, I have to say these are harder messages to tell, for example, child disciplinary issues. Um, in China, it is more culturally acceptable for parents to dis discipline children in certain way, which may not be seen as accept acceptable in the United States. So um, we also remind parents not to do that on the screen and um, there's even parent, per parenting, I would say, educational messages that we had to invite an external um, child education expert to help curate that content uh, for parents to see. And of course, it's not you know, being played to every parent. It is when there are sort of complaints by, parent, uh, by teachers about certain parents, um, then we would 
gently send uh, the message to parents to, to look at those videos. Um, but again, you know, it takes us a while to figure out what is the most culturally sensitive and effective way to communicate those really important yet, you know, sensitive topics. Um, and I would say at the core of it is actually both sides trying to solve the problems. Um, and it takes cross-functional team members from both the United States and Beijing from various teams, whether it's legal, PR, policy, community management, um, you know, service team and student side, like everyone has to provide input to find the right balance. Um, so I would say that's kind of our secret sauce. Well, you have much to teach us because the world is gonna look much more like VIP Kid uh, as we go forward. Um, Shanta, I want, we only have a few moments left um, and I wanna give you last words here. Um, but <clears throat> first of all, I'd, I'd be just be curious to know um, if you had any reactions to the survey results, what surprised you, what, what, uh, what maybe reinforced some thoughts and, and feed that into how does Netflix manage risk and opportunity when it comes to streaming content? So I'd be curious to know if you could weave those two together. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. I think the key takeaway from that survey was that there really is a need for parental controls. Um, and I think parents are looking for ways to bridge the gap, um, like has been discussed so much on this panel. Um, there's so much out there on the internet. There are so many services offering different offerings and how parents navigate that and manage their experiences for their kids and families can be challenging. Um, so there is a need for it and it just reinforces for us the need to invest in raising awareness and to keep improving our own service to meet those needs. Um, so first things first, as a curated service, it really limits the risk, right? Um, everything on our service is created by professionals, filmmakers, and creators. So as, as Mas Banyu said, there's actually a lot to celebrate on, in the online experience. Um, and we feel like there are far more opportunities um, in, on our service than risks, um, which is why parents really enjoy our service and, and kids love the content that we have on it. But it really comes down to us being focused at Netflix as providing an experience that can deliver on the three C's that I mentioned earlier choice, convenience, and control. Consumers and our members really want choice and convenience is a no-brainer. And parental controls really address the key concern in our space about ensuring age-appropriate content is being served up at the right time. Well, that's just about as good as it gets as a summary. I really, really appreciate that. Uh, Shanta, uh, Wenchi, and John, thank you so much for sharing your expertise and wisdom and, and, and the extraordinary experiences when, when she, that are going on on your platform that, as I say, we have much to learn from. So thank you all very much. Um, I'm now going to uh, invite my good friend Amitab to rejoin me for the last few minutes of this event. There you are. Uh, and maybe we can come up with some summary notes. And while we're uh, changing the screens around, um, I notice a number of questions have come through uh, please, please uh, send us in any other questions you have about anything you've seen or heard so far. Amitabh, um, welcome back. Um, what have you seen and heard? What, uh, what has struck you about the conversations and the presentations so far? Oh, firstly, it's, it's so good to have so many like-minded people across the globe and timelines uh, focusing on solutions because most of the time what we are surrounded with uh, are problems. So it's really good to have um, this, this, this positivity that we are working towards uh, uh, solutions. And uh, it was a learning actually of the last uh, two hours is that when so many minds come together, there is so much new learning happening. So what I definitely learned and hoped about uh, was a network, which I see as a major, major requirement where we all can co-learn uh, be it from uh, VIP Kids or from ICT Watch or from Social Media Matters and Fossey. And there, your first slide where you have so many of these uh, companies, I was wondering maybe it's time to create a similar slide 
of these organizations across the globe that are uh, uh, working together towards digital parenting that helps uh, bring uh, global knowledge, but also local nuances uh, to the space of uh, digital parenting and uh, literacy. So that was one uh, idea that kept on coming back in my mind as I was listening to uh, all the various speakers speak. Interesting, interesting. Um, I wanna just bring in some of the participants uh, we have here from Darren Lauer. Uh, be your child's best parent and not their best friend. There is a difference. Uh, thank you, Darren. Um, picking up on Mr. Balcom's point, how can we empower the older kids more given that they are allergic to the concept of parental controls? Uh, Amitabh, what's your reaction to that question? Uh, well, let's treat older kids as young adults and uh, uh, more than controlling, maybe the word there is collaboration and that changes uh, everything. And I completely know that uh, uh, 10 years onwards, it becomes very difficult if you try to um, control them. Rather, collaborative parenting is something that a lot of people encourage. And uh, the easiest uh, way to approach it is with the why. That, okay, if we want to see this content, why are we so interested in it? And uh, discussion, discussion, discussion uh, is the, uh, I think the problem remains in timing that parents nowadays do not have time. And my only answer over there is, well, you need time for your children. There is no way around that aspect. We can create all the technology and the tools, but uh, you need to give time to your children uh, when it comes to parenting. Absolutely. Um, my colleague, Aaron has said that uh, she has uh, put up a link to a blog post by another colleague, Emily Mulder, um, our program director that gives further context and compares our 2020 parental control research with the new APAC poll. So please click on that and, and, and have a look. Um, Amitab, uh, given what you've heard and, and, and maybe what you're currently working on, what tangible steps do you think can be taken in your country, in India, and, and maybe in other parts of the region uh, to better educate parents and young people on online safety issues? Uh, I think, uh, you know, starting with your first P of policy, something uh, that Mr. Rakesh Maheshwari said, which is the allocation of business rules. I think safety standards or standards in general uh, need to be developed. And I hope that these are developed by uh, uh, think tanks and the industry rather than the government, because then it becomes more controlling. And in order to um, have a free space on the internet that we all want, uh, have free space for content um, and expression, it is important that we develop these standards. I mean, Netflix is right up there and doing great work, uh, has actually set the standards for parental controls, for advisory, for description. Maybe the same know-how needs to be translated across uh, industry and across the new uh, platforms that are emerging. And when it comes to awareness, uh, there is no way around uh, schools and uh, colleges. And um, uh, it was highlighted by many participants and panelists that uh, we need to get more stakeholders into this discussion. So uh, in India specifically, we need to work very, very closely with the schools and the education ministry, so to say, because uh, uh, parenting and online safety, these have come into the mandate education. So in India, and I think in the other countries as well, uh, getting more stakeholders on board, listening to them and ensuring that they have both ownership and accountability uh, becomes extremely important. Well, okay, so you mentioned industry and um, you know what, what more could interest, industry do to create a safer and more trustworthy environment. And by the way, um, you know, I know this is rather controversial, but Twitter's having some issues in India, to say the least, right now. What what more could be done uh, to for them to to create a safer environment? Uh, when they plan their business model, they need to look into the current scenario and policy of the country. Right? I mean, uh, Facebook used to have this motto of "move fast and break things." Well, now it is about taking it slow and making and building bridges because government is an important part. Uh, some uh, platforms like ByteDance learned it the very hard way in India. So uh, we need to make sure that we uh, work together with the government 
and working together with the government is not very difficult when you have the citizens together. So very, very specifically, when it comes to platforms, you need to take the citizens with you. Uh, the digital literacy part needs to go digitalization. It is not just enough to put the product out there, but it is also important to have the education part of the product equally in space. Uh, John mentioned mm. safety by design. Well, awareness of safety by design is also extremely important because uh, uh, like we saw in your survey, a lot of parents are aware about it. But like I said, many parents are still not online. They're going to come online tomorrow. So large scale public awareness campaigns is a solution for a country like India, 1.4 billion people. And uh, then also customizing it as per the local nuances and languages. We have 26 official languages. So that is the scale at which we need to work. And it is not only industry which can do it alone. Uh, that is where we need the schools, the government and the parents together on it. So, uh, I mean, I've said it many times, but the marketing and the media uh, teams of uh, all the companies, including Netflix is amazing. They need to be on board that how can we market parental controls to, uh, you know, parents at large. Well, in which case, let's, let's end with the role of government. Obviously, uh, you know, we do believe, because you and I are both NGO guys, you know, the extraordinary importance of the nonprofit sector. We're putting pressure on industry to do more. Government does still have a role. Where do you think they would best play in this space? The government has the most important role, right? I mean, they are the ones that the citizens have elected to create the regulations, so to say, if at all. And they are the ones who need to lead this movement. Uh, NGOs can provide the knowledge, industry can provide the content, but government needs to have the intent to make sure every citizen, the dream of digital India, and this, this program is happening across APAC regions, can mm. only be realized when all the citizens are aware of what does digital India mean? What does online safety mean? So when we are making data very cheap, like we are making it in India, we need to make sure that every user is informed about it. VIP Kids sets a beautiful example. Every child who comes online sees this video. Does every citizen who come online see a video or read a WhatsApp that this, these are your safety mechanisms, this is where you can go? Just like John mentioned, that this is where you can come if you need help. So we need to tell them about the mechanisms. The government needs to inform them about all the mechanisms that are present uh, in India, as well as on the platforms that are coming to India. Brilliant. Great place to finish. Thank you, my friend. Always, always a pleasure to work with you and, and your group. I really, really am grateful that you participated and, and brought folks to the table. Um, I, would, I just want to end with a few final remarks, um, some thank yous, uh, first of all, to, uh, to Josh Korn and Shanta and Zizi and all at, the, at Netflix who have made this forum possible. Um, big thank you to our speakers and our panelists for taking the time to share their expertise and perspectives on this vital topic. Um, to my colleagues at FOSI, uh, particularly Emily Mulder and Aaron McCowie, who have worked tirelessly behind the scenes uh, to bring this event to life. And finally, to all of you uh, for your hard work and commitment to making the online world safer for kids and their families. I thank you all. I look forward to working with you in the months and the years ahead. Uh, and I think I am now going to hand it back to Janina to uh, close things off for us. Yes, um, thank you so much to our industry panel speakers, of course, to Stephen and Amitabh as well. We hope it has been an interesting discussion for everyone who attended here as industry players, online safety advocates, representatives of educational institutions, government, and for those of you who are taking the role of a parent as well. To viewers from the United States, we also thank you as well for staying with us. We're aware that it's a bit late there. It's 11 p.m., so we're glad to have you despite the late hour. Um, I believe the organizations who spoke today have websites and social media, so everyone, please feel free to check them out and follow. We hope everyone motivates, um, is motivated to look into these kinds of conversations deeper and make online spaces as safe and therefore meaningful 
tool for kids and families. So again, thank you everyone and have a great day ahead. <laughs>